Hi all, this is Dr. K streaming live from Long Island, New York, where I have a distinguished guest today. Many of you who follow the show know that I am a shareholder in Athlon Medical and have often talked about its virtues. I'm a big fan of the Hemo Purifier. And I'm a big fan of the new man at the helm, Dr. Timothy Rodell, who's with us today. Timothy, would you like to tell us a little bit about your background before we get started? Sure, and, and thanks for having me on. It's, um, it, it's a real pleasure. You and I had a good chat. Yes. Um, I think it was probably a couple months ago. Um, <clears throat> Right after you became CEO, you like yeah, to... Well, no, I, I've been CEO actually since uh, since December two thousand eighteen. But um, I'm a I'm as you know I'm a pulmonary and critical care doc by training. Um, practiced in academic medicine for about ten years in both emergency medicine, internal medicine, and pulmonary and critical care. Uh, but um, I left about thirty five years ago to start my first company um, and ever since then I have been in the business of starting and financing and building um, small companies. Um, Athlon is my fifth. Um, four of them were public as, um, as Athlon is um, and I, I've spent my career doing that but mostly doing clinical development and regulatory strategy in a number of different areas initially mostly in critical care areas um, but for the last 10 or 12 years, um, I've been focused almost entirely in virology, um, in immunology, and in oncology. And so when I got a call from the, uh, from the current chairman of uh, Athlon, who's a very old colleague and friend of mine, um, Chuck Fisher, um, who has a similar background to mine. He was the uh, chief of critical care at the Cleveland Clinic for many years. Um, and he said, I've got a company that I'm the chairman of. And I need some help. Or will you come look at it? And so I flew out to San Diego from uh, from my place in Colorado and spent a couple days with uh, with Chuck. Um, and what I heard really um, intrigued me um, because I think that what the Hemo Purifier is 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 it's really a unique device. We can do things that nobody else can do. Um, and so the science is very good. Um, I'm still a physician first and foremost, and it, I thought it had a really good chance um, of helping patients. Um, so good science, um, good opportunity to help patients, um, and just a spectacular little team of scientists um, that it's been a delight to work with. I absolutely am fascinated by the Hemo Purifier, a device out of Star Trek or Star Wars. I mean... <laughs> The thought of being able to use an external to device to cure cancer, to cure viral diseases, is just mind-blowing. Well, that's the wonderful thing about this business, is that you get to develop things um, that can help patients, um, but you also have tools that you can use to understand the science. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more about oncology another time, um, but um, the ability to remove specific biologically important particles from the blood, which is what the hemo purifier does by a really unique mechanism of action um, that we can talk about if you like. Um, what it allows us to do is intervene in a way that we understand a lot about the pathophysiology of, of different diseases. And as you know, since you've been following the company for a long time, we've been in the viral uh, business for a long time. We have generated a lot of data um, before I got to the company in hepatitis C um, and showed that we could clear very large quantities of hepatitis C virus in the circulation um, and that the product was very safe, very well tolerated. We've never seen a serious adverse event um, by the FDA's definition um, in any of the clinical uses. Hepatitis C is not a major clinical opportunity, uh, uh, commercial opportunity anymore. Gilead fixed that. Um, and that's wonderful for the, um, for the hepatitis C community. Um, but it gave us very good proof of concept. And then, as you also know, and many of your, your viewers probably know, um, we um, treated um, a single patient um, about four or five years ago with Ebola virus. It was a, a physician from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières who was flown airlifted out, out of uh, West Africa to a hospital in Germany. And we were able to get a hemopurifier over there in time. He was on a ventilator. 
Um, he was on uh, multiple um, uh, vasopressors, blood drugs to support his blood pressure. He was in renal failure and comatose. Um, and he was treated on a hemopurifier for about six hours. Um, and we were able to clear large um, quantities of virus from his blood. Um, and um, he subsequently recovered. Now that's one, one patient, put us on the cover of Fortune magazine, I think. Um, um, but I remember it like it was yesterday. That was big news. It, well, it was big news, um, and, but it, it's a very good, it was a very good single patient demonstration of a very meaningful clinical outcome um, in a deadly disease. So when this pandemic started, um, obviously, the first thing that came to mind, um, and I was actually in, uh, I was in San Diego as the first patients were being airlifted into Miramar from a cruise ship. Um, it turns out it had been in California for a lot longer than that, but we started looking at this and saying, well, we've got a device that can clear virus from the blood. Um, so there are really two questions. One is, can we clear this particular virus? Um, and we, we've had, I mentioned what we've done in the clinic in humans with hepatitis C, with Ebola, and we've actually treated a patient or two with HIV. Um, but in the laboratory, we have a laboratory version of the hemopurifier. We call it the mini hemopurifier. That's exactly the same technology. And we've tested virtually every major class of viruses that affect humans. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we've tested um, virtually all of the herpes viruses. We've tested multiple different strains of influenza, including the reconstituted 1918 um, epidemic virus. Um, we have, uh, we've looked at um, Ebola virus um, in, the, in the laboratory as well as in a single patient. We've looked at the Marburg agent, which is another Ebola-like um, virus. And we looked um, several years ago um, at a version, a lab version of the MERS virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, which as you know, is a member of the same family of coronaviruses um, right. as um, SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID um, right. agent. Um, in fact, they are not only both coronaviruses, they're both beta coronaviruses, which right. are the ones um, that are um, the most trouble to humans. And so we had a lot of data that convinced us um, that we could probably clear it. Um, but we, as you know, the, this particular coronavirus is so dangerous that you can't put live virus in anything but a very high containment um, facility. But what we were able to do is we were able to obtain um, one of the key proteins of the virus, and we showed that the lab version could clear that. So we, we were really very convinced um, that, um, that it would work um, to clear um, COVID, the COVID-2 agent, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, in, the, in the call yesterday, I think you implied that uh, the uh, problem with the sickest people on ventilators, number one, is the uh, cytokine response the, and people die from it, the inflammatory nature of the disease. But also concomitant with that, you found that there's a high viral load for those the sickest people. Well, yeah, un you know, unfortunately, we don't know if it's a high viral load because nobody, none of the papers that are out there, um, and there are, as you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers being published. I spend an hour or two every morning reading the last 24 hours of publications um, in this agent, but there are no data out there showing how much virus is circulating in the blood. What the data show, however, and a lot of these papers um, come from, uh, came from China fairly early on, is that the presence of virus as detected by RNA in the, in the circulation is one of the most highly predictive um, measures of outcome. That is, patients who have virus in their circulation are the ones who are the most likely to end up on ventilators and the most likely to die. And incidentally, they're also the ones that have the highest cytokine levels, as you implied. There are two things going on here. One is the viral infection. Uh, I think it's problems. not unreasonable to assume that if one is so sick that they don't need to ventilate it, that their viral load is high and probably in the blood. I, I, think that, I think that that's probably going to turn out to be true. But the interesting and exciting thing from a scientific perspective is we may be the only ones who are in a position to answer that question. Um, because if we... Yeah, exactly. We can measure the viral load before... They put their blood goes into the hemopurifier. We can measure the viral load after their blood 
comes out of the hemopurifier and we can take the used hemopurifier and we can actually get the virus out of it and show how much we I'm, I'm going to share with you my gut feeling. My gut feeling is that this is going to not only show to be safe, which you already know it is, but efficacious even in your feasibility study. Well, I hope so. Well, uh, you can't prove efficacy with a 40-person trial. No, no you, no, you can't. But what you can show is mechanism, and that's really important. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I agree with you. And, and the purpose of this, number one, the main purpose of this is to get a potentially um, helpful therapeutic device into patients. Um, that's, that's the most important one. But the second most important one is to show that we can clear this virus. I agree with you that 40 patients is not enough to draw um, absolutely hard conclusions about efficacy, but we may be able to squint and see. Um, now, unfortunately, this virus is going to be around for a long time. Yeah. And if we, if we start to see um, things that are encouraging, we will be in a position to do a larger study um, that will get the kind of data that you're talking about. Also, it, it seems like if the safety data is really good, which I'm sure it is, it could be used in conjunction with other, other drugs, such as remdesivir, such as the stem cell products that are being developed to reduce the inflammatory response. It could certainly, there's no reason why it couldn't be used in combination with any other, um, with any other therapy. And that incidentally could include um, other extracorporeal therapies that are more focused on the cytokine. Um, response, but you know, one point I would make about remdesivir is, is, is you have to look at the um, at the data that have been published so far. The efficacy of remdesivir in shortening um, the course of the viral infection was seen almost entirely in patients who weren't that sick. It was in the patients who were not on supplemental oxygen or who were on low flow um, oxygen by nasal prongs. The more critically ill patients, who are the ones that we're going to be treating. Um, um, did not apparently show any response. Uh, companies like Mesoblast and Athesis and uh, Fluoristem that are working on uh, stem cell therapy to, to what do they call them, modulate the cytokine response. Well, um, I'm not an expert on those companies, so I'm not going to weigh in on but, that. But it, it, presumably, they, it could be used in conjunction with something like that. There's no particular reason why it could not be. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So I'm very, very excited. I think you're going to do well in your phase one trial. I think it's going to fill quicker than you would imagine because of all the increases and spikes in states like Texas and uh, California and so on. And that's where you're going to be going with it, I'm sure. Well, we're going to be going where the virus is. That's the reason we, we got authorized for 20 centers. We're not going to open 20 centers immediately. Um, but we want to be in a position to open a center where the virus... Uh, may not need to open 20 centers. We, we very well could. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, this being a big step in the right direction to saving very sick people that are unfortunate enough to wind up on ventilators in, from COVID-19. And it's been a pleasure having you. And I'm looking forward to the next step in your... In, in where you take this company, because now there's a veteran CEO, you don't mind my talking a little bit about you. That's okay. Who has tremendous experience, unlike previous CEOs, not that they're bad people, but I have total confidence in you, Dr. Rodell, and that's why I have a core position in this company that I'm gonna just continue holding and hopefully adding to it. And that's my disclosure that I am a shareholder and I can I plan on continuing to be. Well, I, I hope we will continue to earn your confidence. And what I have to say is your, your, your words about me are very kind, but I have an unbelievable team to work with of scientists and development professionals. Um, and we wouldn't go anywhere without that. Without, the, without companies like you, we would have little hope, I think, of facing the challenges of the future. But with companies like yours, we have great hope. Let's end Thank you. on that note. And thanks, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. You know, I hope I hit record. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank All you. Right, Stay safe.